Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. My name is John with Ember Spot Pythons. So glad you're here. In this rundown episode, we're looking at the top five things that we learned during our very first breeding season here at Ember Spot Pythons. We learned a lot, we had a lot of fun. It was an amazing experience, but we definitely took away a lot of good information. Uh, we always wanna learn from everything that we do to get better, to evolve, and we wanna share our process, our mistakes, our successes with you guys so that we can take your ball python experience to that next level as well. So hope you enjoy it. Make sure you subscribe, hit that like button, and let's get right into it. Here we go. First things first is research and preparation is key. Alright, so number one guys, research and preparation is key. So obviously if we're gonna venture into breeding, you wanna make sure that you've done enough research and preparation so that you can do it successfully with very minimal stress or situations that can go wrong, right? So you wanna make sure obviously that you have everything in your snake room uh, that involve your snakes, your enclosures, your husbandry, your equipment, your cleaning, all that kind of squared away, running pretty flawlessly before you venture into the next step of breeding. Uh, but when it comes to breeding, you also want to make sure you have specific equipment for that set up and squared away as well. Uh, for example, your incubators, make sure the temperatures and the humidity is running right. You have your egg boxes and all the equipment that comes with that. You have enough uh, hatching racks or enclosures for all the hatchlings that you're preparing to hatch out. Even if you don't sell them right away or if you're planning on selling them, just make sure that you're able to keep them for the long run just in case anything happens and you can't sell them off, right? So you want to be able to kind of house them take care of them for the long run just in case. Uh, but beyond that guys, in our learning experience for this season, we realized that one of our breeder females had gotten sick after she laid her eggs, meaning she wasn't getting back on food, uh, she was deteriorating, you can see her body weight and condition was just getting really bad, and months and months went on without her eating and she's looking worse and worse. So that kind of scared us, but again, we did a lot of research and preparation for a situation like this where we were able to give her uh, a lot of different varieties of food to try to get her back on food. Uh, so frozen to live to ASF. And what we realized that, that she was hungry and she wanted to eat. And as she started to eat, she would regurgitate right away. So we knew something was up. And then a few days after that regurgitation, you would start to see the saliva with blood kind of being laid around in her tub. So we put her in quarantine just in case something was up. And we were totally prepared to call our local vet, exotic vet, take her in for an appointment, get her checked out. Uh, so that's kind of like the point I want to get here is the part of your research and preparation for your breeding season Make sure you go into those extreme what-if scenarios as well, right? What if one of your female breeders uh, has an issue? Do you have a local exotic vet are ready to go with their address and phone number put aside for these type of emergency, right? Are you prepared to give them uh, any type of antibiotics by injection if you had to, right? So that's kind of what happened to us. We took our girl Lacey to the vet, they checked her out, and they gave us some antibiotics um, to be administered through intramuscular injection, which was basically injections once a week. So that kind of opened our eyes to a new experience and we took care of it, right? But we were prepared for that because we knew that we needed to do everything that we could to make sure our girl got back to full health. Um, once the full medication was given to her after a few weeks, we took her back to the vet and the next step for us, it was important for us to kind of see if she had anything to do with that NIDO virus, which is extremely dangerous and deadly to your whole collection. So we wanted to get her tested for that. We did that, came back negative, thank God. Um, so we kept her in quarantine and the next step beyond that, just from research, we saw that there were some probiotic, um, probiotic powders for reptiles that we can try. So we started to take this probiotic um, powder, put it a little bit into her water, left it there throughout the week, and we would keep doing that uh, on a week-to-week -week basis. Also, every time we try to feed, we would powder some of that, uh, we would put some of that powder, probiotic medication on top of the rat so that as it went down, hopefully that probiotic would get in her system better and it would strengthen her insides in case it was something to do with her insides, just kind of losing a lot of that nutrition and that strength that it needed to keep that rat down. And uh, thank God that that kind of worked. I'm not sure if it was a combination of the antibiotics or if it was a probiotics, whatever it was, but putting all that into work allowed her to get back into gear. She started eating for us without regurgitating and she's doing extremely well. Uh, so that was a huge learning experience for us going through that process, uh, not freaking out, not stressing about it too much, but just taking the steps to research, 
and go ahead and do whatever it takes to get our girl back on food and get her healthy again. Uh, so she's doing good. She should be leaving quarantine uh, within a week or so, getting back with the collection. And of course, we're going to give her a year or two off just to make sure that she is good to go. Um, and we're going to talk about her eggs soon and one of the next things that we learned. All right, so on to the next one. Okay. Number two, hatchlings will eat what they want when they want. So number two, hatchlings will eat what they want, when they want, <laughs> right? I know some of you know exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to getting your hatchlings on food. Uh, but here we feed uh, frozen thawed here in our collection. So we say, why not try frozen thawed, see how it goes. I know that it's more popular or more common practice to do uh, like live mouse hoppers, stuff like that. But I said, let's give it a shot. And to our surprise, we had a really good success. We had about 90, 95% of our animals or our hatchlings jump right onto frozen thawed rat fuzzies with no issues whatsoever. But of course there are a select few that wanted to take their sweet time. Uh, and I know sometimes, uh, you know, we feel like we should be rushing into it, but remember they have a lot of that yolk that they've soaked in and absorbed from the egg uh, before they're hatched out. So they may not be ready for another meal. They may be still kind of processing that at their own pace. Uh, so sometimes it can take a few weeks, right? So we started two weeks after their first shed and some of them wanted to wait, you know, three weeks up to a month even after their first shed to get on food. Um, but no big deal. We had about three that were giving us a hard time. So we started to change things up. And that's, that's kind of the key point here is be prepared to switch up the meals, right? If you're only feeding frozen, maybe go to a, uh, to a live rat. If that's not working, go to a live mouse hopper, right? Kind of switch it up, see what, see what it is that they prefer or might feel more comfortable with. Uh, another thing that you can do, a little trick that we've kind of all learned from the uh, bigger breeders and stuff is maybe switch up their environment, right? Because they are creatures of habit. And sometimes by switching things up, it'll kind of reset their brain and give them a fresh start, fresh look at the rat or meal that you're trying to introduce to them. So that means, I, that means something like you can start them off on paper towel substrate and once you've gone a few times and they're not eating for you, maybe you can go ahead and take that substrate and now put a cocoa husk or a cocoa chip in there and a different substrate and it kind of refreshes their mind, renews everything. And again, give them some time and now go back to try again. And that might work really well. And of course, there's also little tricks like doing the vanilla extract on top of the, the head, right? You put a little drop of vanilla extract on top of the mouse or rat head. And that smell or sensory overload will definitely help the snake want to eat that rat or rodent. Uh, so these little tricks that we tried and we kind of mingled with uh, and that definitely helped in the process of getting all of our hatchings to eat well, to start growing and to not be uh, stuck. Also with all that, be prepared just in case that if you have to take it to that next level to assist feed, right? We were really trying not to get to that point of uh, having to assist feed uh, because we know that's very stressful for the animal, but I know it's gonna happen eventually, it does happen, so just be prepared for that. And we were totally committed, we did our research, we did our planning, we were ready to do that if we had to, right? But uh, we were just trying to be patient and give them the opportunity to feed themselves. Uh, but it all worked out and all of our hatchlings are doing awesome, so uh, just something to keep in mind. All right, let's go on to the next one. Number three, some things are out of your control. one for us this one is some things are just out of your control right what I mean by that is there's gonna be times where things happen in your collection with your animals with your eggs with your breeding experience that are just out of your control you did everything right you did your research you did the preparations you did the planning you had the equipment everything was fine-tuned just how you want it or how it should be yet something went wrong 
right? Trust me, it happens. Things can go wrong and it's just out of our control. Some things weren't meant to be. And that happened to us. Going back to our girl Lacey who laid her clutch and got sick. Um, she laid an egg, she laid a clutch of beautiful, healthy, pearly white eggs. I'm telling you, they had excellent veins, excellent embryos. The eggs looked beautiful. We went into the egg box and this was our second clutch. So we knew exactly what to do because our first clutch did phenomenal. They did perfect. You know, our egg boxes were, were, were right. Uh, humidity was good. Temperature was good in the incubator. Everything was stable. And uh, next thing you know, the eggs from this second clutch started to deteriorate from the inside out. They were all dying, they were all molding, they were sweating profusely. It was just the weirdest thing because it was literally like they were just going bad from the inside out. Not like external mold on top, it was just from the inside out. So it was really weird. Of course that got us stressed out, concerned, thinking, man, did I do something wrong? Did we mess things up? Did we destroy or kill these eggs? What did we do wrong? Um, and of course we reached out to a lot of different breeders and did more research and got more experience on it and we figured out that sometimes these things just happen, right? They're gonna happen, it's not always gonna be perfect and you just have to be prepared for that, right? So don't freak out, Do obviously put in the work, do the research, get the equipment set up, do everything right, right? But don't, if something still goes wrong, don't beat yourself up about it, just learn from it, you move on from it, right? And we try to do the best we can every time for these animals. Uh, so. That was a pretty heartening experience because it was our second clutch and we didn't, weren't sure if we were messing things up or not, but it, it, is, it was just one of those weird, uh, weird clutches that laid for us, right? Because after that one, everything else which continued to go flawlessly, first, third clutch, fourth clutch, fifth clutch, all those went really well, had no issues. Um, so it is what it is. We learn from it and we move on and we just have to accept that some things are out of our control. All right, going on to the next one. Number four, you don't have to do this alone. Mm. All right, lesson number four, you don't have to do this alone. Right? That's something that I had to learn kind of the hard way because I'm the kind of guy that's used to just doing things 110% by myself. I research, I learn, I grow, and I go at it 110% full commitment. And I feel like that's, that's good for me, right? But uh, learning to get out of my comfort zone a little bit and reach out, not only is building that community with, uh, with others, make friendships and good relationships, but you're able to help them, they're able to help you. We learn from each other, we grow from each other, and that's really a beautiful thing. And we have such amazing people in this reptile community that are just willing to help. They wanna share their knowledge, they wanna show the love, and they wanna support each other. So don't do this alone, don't feel like you're stuck by yourself. Uh, reach out. Uh, there's a bunch of awesome information out there through Patreon. A lot of the top readers are doing amazing things on Patreons, uh, so you can learn a lot from them. But even not going that route, I mean, just reach out, ask questions, uh, connect with the local breeders in your community. Uh, that's something that I haven't had a chance to jump into just yet, but I do wanna give a huge shout out to uh, my good friend, one of my close neighbors, uh, Dave from J&B Exotics. Um, he is new to the breeding uh, experience, right? This should be his first season coming into it, but he was a huge asset and a help for us during our first breeding season especially when it came to the rat situation uh, or our hatchlings not eating our frozen thaw situation. Uh, almost every week he went out of his way to go and find whatever I needed to help kind of get these three hatchlings that were being difficult to eat, whether it was he went out to go get the live rats or the live mouse hoppers, or he went to look for ASF, whatever he could do to come and help. And he would come by every feeding night and he would help me with these hatchlings. So huge shout out to Dave. Thank you so much. If you're watching this, thank you. We appreciate you. We love you. And uh, we're gonna continue growing in that bond and that relationship and help each other out. So I'll put a link to his uh, Instagram below. Go check them out. They're an awesome family, just getting into the breeding stuff and uh, they're doing awesome with their collection. So Dave, J&B Exotics, go check them out. All right, so don't do this alone. Let's get right into the next one. Number five. Braiding ball pythons is so awesome, it's addictive. Seriously. Okay, bye. <laughs> And 
lastly, number five, right? Ball python breeding is very addictive. <laughs> That's something that I learned. It is so much fun. It was such an awesome and amazing experience and I am completely hooked on it, right? To be able to go in there and just see a clutch of eggs, go through the process of putting them into the egg box, the incubator, waiting a couple months, seeing them first pip, right? And seeing the, the snakes starting to come out and have new life, right? That's so awesome, such an amazing experience and we are completely hooked on the on this experience. But a few things that we have to take away from that, that yes, it is fun, yes, it is addictive, but a few notes, right? One thing I learned is that I can't hold all of them back. As much as I wanted to, of course my girls wanted to, we wanted to hold all of them back, keep the babies, uh, we, can't, we can't hold all of them back. So you gotta kind of plan things out, pick and choose which ones are gonna be helpful for moving forward in your breeding operation and your, your projects and your goals, right? Have that kind of pre-planned so that you know which ones are you gonna hold back, which ones make sense, and the other ones you can, you can let go of. Um, the second thing is you can't buy everything that you want, right? So you definitely wanna be careful when you're spending all your money investing into these ball pythons. Make purchases that make sense to what your projects are, right? Set out your goals, figure out where you wanna go in, in the next few years, have long-term, mid-term, and short-term goals, and stay kind of focused on those, right? Don't just go and buy every snake that you find, you think it's a good deal, it looks pretty, right? Every once in a while, sure, you can you know, do what you have to do to buy the things that you want, but have a purpose for these animals, right? Have a purpose for your projects, and make these investments worthwhile. Get quality animals, that makes sense for your projects and it will help you take you to that next level. Uh, and that's something that we're definitely trying to fine tune here in our collection. We're staying focused, we're working on a lot of Ultramel. We love the bamboo, so of course we combine bamboo Ultramel together. Um, we're definitely adding all that into clown now, trying to go into the Ultramel clown route uh, and eventually uh, jumping into some Ultramel clown pie bamboo ultramel clown pie, all the kind of cool stuff. So we're kind of starting to put everything together and staying focused on our, our key projects. And most importantly guys, enjoy the process. It's so easy to get fixated on trying to catch up to the biggest breeders out there or the next breeder out there uh, or make it all about the money, right? Trying to sell off your hatchlings and everything that you have so that you can put more money back in the bank. It's not about that guys. We know that this is not a sprint. This is more of a marathon type operation. Uh, so it's important to set your goals, have vision, know exactly where you want to go or where you want to be in this industry um, and start taking baby steps, right? Set small goals and enjoy the successes on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Enjoy the journey of where you're at now on the way to where you're going and you'll see that you get so much more out of your breeding experience and your day-to-day -day grind that you have to put into these animals to make sure that they're healthy and that you're growing. Uh, learn something new every day. Always try to evolve. Always try to help somebody out, right? Share in this wonderful knowledge of, of community and uh, share the support for with everybody else, right? And that's what we're trying to do here. We're learning every day. We're trying to evolve. We're committed to our journey here and we want to share everything that we go through, our ups and downs and our experiences with you guys so that we can help take your ball python knowledge, care and experience to that next level. Uh, so please enjoy the process guys don't get caught up on trying to be better than anybody else or comparing yourself to other breeders enjoy where you're at put in the work make sure you have purpose and plan plan things out for your collection and what works for you and what makes you happy right and just you'll see that you'll go a long way with that all right so hopefully you guys learned something from this uh, or got something out of it because we know we learned so much from our first season breeding ball pythons we can't wait for the next one we are already starting to do some of our pairings and we're looking forward to evolving always continue to grow and we want to share all that experience with you guys of course so make sure you're subscribed hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next videos and uh we'll hear from you guys soon all right be safe out there be blessed we'll see you guys on the next one